Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing the mammalian circadian uh, timing system. Okay, right. So, we've now discussed the circadian clock within cells. Okay, we've discussed that in all human cells, what is happening is that the levels of these proteins, period and cryptochrome, go up during the day and then go down during the night. And the reason for this is that uh, there is a heterodimer transcription factor, uh, which is BMAL1 dimerized with either N pass 2 or clock. And this heterodimer then binds to an E box within the promoter region upstream of period and cryptochrome genes and increases the expression of those period and cryptochrome proteins. Okay, the period and cryptochrome proteins go into the cytoplasm, form a complex, and then this complex comes back into the nucleus and interferes with the activation of uh, the transcription of the period and cryptochrome genes by the BMAL1 m pass clock uh, heterodimer. Okay, so it stops uh, this activation of its own production, basically, and it therefore is a feedback loop. Okay, when this happens, you're going to stop producing more period and cryptochrome. Meanwhile, period and cryptochrome levels will be going uh, down because they're being broken down. Okay, so that triggers this down phase of the levels of period and cryptochrome. Okay, until you get to a level then when uh, BMAL1 and bound to n pass 2 slash clock uh, will then no longer be being inhibited by these complexes because they're no longer present and therefore uh, will start the activation of the production of period and cryptochrome again and this cycle takes 24 hours. We then discuss that there is an accessory cycle which is that um, BMAL1 uh, dimerized with n pass 2 or clock also binds to and act the promoter region of um, rev herb alpha um, gene, okay, and increases the production of this protein rev herb alpha. Rev herb alpha itself is a transcription factor, okay, and I don't think I quite finished this picture here, okay, it binds to the promoter region of the BMAL1 gene, okay, so here's the promoter region, and I'll colour this promoter region, whoops, promoter region. I'll colour this promoter region in in orange. Okay, so it binds to the promoter region of the BMAL1 uh, protein gene, and it's a transcriptional repressor. Okay, so it blocks um, the expression of BMAL1 by stopping RNA polymerase 2 from being able to bind to the promoter region. Okay, and therefore leads to BMAL1 levels within the um, cell going down. Okay, so whilst rev herb alpha goes up and it goes up in phase with period and cryptochrome proteins, BMAL1 therefore also comes down. So not only is the rise in period and cryptochrome proteins up here going to stop the production of more period and cryptochrome proteins by directly stopping the interaction of the BMAL1 n pass 2 or BMAL1 clock heterodimer with the e box in the promoter region of the period and cryptochrome genes, but you're also getting the reduction in the levels of BMAL1 at this peak, okay? So BMAL1 is oscillating completely out of phase with period and cryptochrome levels. Both of these things are going to lead to um, the production of further period and cryptochrome proteins going down, okay, uh, which means that the levels are going to fall, okay. Meanwhile, you're also going to get the fall in the levels of Rev Herb Alpha because the fall in the BMAL1 levels means that you're no longer going to be producing more Rev Herb Alpha. So Rev Herb Alpha will also come down. The fall in the level of Rev Herb Alpha uh, will then allow BMAL1 to be transcribed again and therefore BMAL1 will go back up. Okay, so period uh, cryptochrome and rev herb alpha will all crash down whilst BMAL1 will come back up and then we're ready to repeat the cycle again. 
Okay, and as I say, if you chop out this accessory loop here, for instance, by knocking out Rev Herb Alpha, you still get the oscillation in period in cryptochrome. So the transcriptional, translational feedback loop that you have there alone is enough uh, to produce this 24-hour oscillation. This is an accessory loop that helps out, basically. Okay, so we now want to talk about what is the point on having this circadian oscillator like this within all of your cells. Okay, well basically many processes that are occurring within cells need to uh, know what time it is because you don't want certain processes to be occurring at night when you're most likely asleep. And the reality is that you might have thought that, well, surely it's the fact that you're asleep that changes those processes, okay? But actually, the cells have a way of predicting when you're going to be asleep for themselves, okay? They have this internal clock, and they can predict when you're going to be asleep, and they will um, adapt their um, uh, processes according to their own calculations, even without the information coming from elsewhere that you are actually asleep. So they have this way of predicting the time of the day and what um, their activity levels need to be at that time of day. So basically, loads of different cells will have their activity levels um, dependent upon the time of day. And the way that they decide what the time of day is, is through this internal circadian oscillator. Okay, so if we plot activity on the y-axis, and then we have time uh, on the x-axis as always, uh, then many cells will have their activity increased during the day. Okay, uh, some cells will have their activity increased during night. Uh, but many cells will increase their activity during the day. So, for instance, uh, hepatocytes uh, change their activities depending on what time of the day it is. Okay, so, uh, for instance, during the daytime, you are likely to be feeding. Okay, so hepatocytes don't need to uh, be releasing glycogen. Um, well, they don't need to be breaking down glycogen and releasing the glucose into the blood. Okay, instead they need to be taking glucose out of the blood and um, storing it as glycogen. And you might say, but hang on a second, that's all moderated surely by negative feedback loops. We measure changes in blood glucose and then adapt accordingly via insulin and glucagon and all of that. But the reality is there are also these predictive mechanisms. The hepatocytes have this mechanism for predicting when blood glucose is likely to go up, and they do it based on the time of the day, okay? So in the, during the daytime, you are likely to be feeding, and therefore glucose levels are likely to go up. So the hepatocytes will uh, set up the glycogenesis processes um, during the daytime, basically. So they are using feed-forward mechanisms. They are preparing uh, for changes in blood glucose level before they've actually occurred, basically. So glycogenesis goes up during the day, which means the storage of glucose as glycogen. So if we, store, if we draw a little picture here of our hepatocyte, okay, our hepatocyte will be taking glucose out of the blood, so we'll just draw a little cartoon of glucose here. Okay, so this is our cartoon of some glucose that's within the blood. And I'll just colour it in in red here. And basically, hepatocytes will be taking up glucose out of the blood during the day and then storing it as polymers of glucose known as glycogen. Okay, and the process of uh, synthesising glycogen from glucose is known as glycogenesis. Okay, creating glycogen. So I've just drew, shown two of them there. I think I should at least add a further one. Okay, but of course it's much longer than just three of the things. So it's a huge great polymer of glucose. So glucose is the monomer in this massive great polymer. And um, that polymer is known as glycogen. Okay, right. So, uh, according to their internal clock, they will decide whether they need to be... Um, 
synthesizing glycogen or breaking glycogen down. Now in the daytime, they, will suit, they know that you're going to feed basically. So uh, they'll be taking glucose out of the blood and synthesizing glycogen. Whereas in the nighttime, uh, they know that you're not going to be feeding, or at least they know that you're not likely to be feeding. So because of their internal clock, they know what time it is. So during the night time, what they will do is they'll break down glycogen back into glucose, basically. And I don't know why I'm drawing it going out the bile duct. So usually hepatocytes have a bile duct one side and the blood on the other side. So I should have the arrow going the other way. Okay, so at night time, they will break down glycogen uh, and turn it back into glucose and release it into the blood. Okay, and this is called glycogenolysis. Okay, right. Uh, so hepatocytes change their activity based on their circadian clock, and this acts as a feed-forward mechanism by which they are predicting likely changes in blood glucose. So it's not a negative feedback system now. It's not a response that is occurring because of changes in blood glucose. It's a predictive mechanism, okay? So the circadian clock is allowing us to predict uh, changes in blood glucose and respond before those changes have even occurred, basically. Okay, right. Uh, other examples are, for instance, myocytes can change their activity, muscle cells. Okay, uh, so what is the activity of muscle cells? Well, it's contraction. Okay, so the levels of contraction of myocytes, for instance, the myocytes which lie in the intestines, those can change on a circadian basis. Okay, in addition, for instance, the cells within the exocrine pancreas. Okay, you only need to be secreting digestive enzymes from the exocrine pancreas during the day when you are feeding. If you're not feeding, you don't need to be secreting digestive enzymes. So the cells of the pancreas are going to be producing digestive enzymes during the day, but not in the night. Okay, and how do they coordinate this? Well, they've got circadian clocks within them. They know during the day they need to be producing digestive enzymes, and during the night they need to uh, not be producing digestive enzymes. Okay, so the message is that many of your cells are changing their activity depending on the time of their internal circadian clock, basically. Okay, right. Uh, now, we need to discuss how are they all in synchrony? We have now seen this transcriptional translational feedback loop, which gives us this oscillating level of period and cryptochrome proteins within the cytoplasm of our cell that oscillates with a 24-hour period. The question that is unanswered is, so how are all the cells of our body in sync? So what do I mean by that? Well, let me draw a picture. Okay, so let's draw... In fact, actually, we only need two cells, okay, to get this message across. Okay, they each have this circadian rhythm within them. They have a mechanism that can oscillate at 24-hour periods, okay? So we'll just show cryptochrome levels. So I told you that what should happen is cryptochrome and pe sorry, period and cryptochrome levels. Period and cryptochrome levels should go up during the day and down at night. So from 0 to 24 hours, but nothing I have told you yet has given you any reason to uh, think that it should be in that phase. So what do I mean by that? Why can't the clock, for instance, start at 12 o'clock during the day and then go down and stop at um, 12 o'clock the next day? Okay, so what's to stop this 24-hour oscillator being like so? Okay, so this is zero, this is 24. Okay, so why are they all in sync, basically? Why are they all in sync, and why are they in sync with the light-dark cycle? Why are the period and cryptochrome levels going up during uh, light time and down during dark time? Okay, why haven't these grown out of sync? Okay, and basically, if you take a Petri dish, okay, if you take a Petri dish of cells, you grow some cells on a Petri dish, you find that they are all out of sync, okay? Absolutely every single one of them will think that it is a different time of day, okay? So they all have the 24-hour oscillator going on, but they're not all in phase with each other, okay? So we want to discuss how is synchrony maintained within the human body, basically, okay? Because it's not maintained at all on cells within a Petri dish. 
There we can now colour in my period and cryptochrome levels here in red. Okay, so uh, basically there is what is known as a master clock, which is responsible for making sure that all the other cells of the body have their circadian oscillators uh, going in the right time phase, basically. Okay, they make sure that all the other cells are in tuned, basically, that they all have their period and cryptochrome levels going up during light time and then down during dark time, up during night time, down during dark time, rather than, for instance, going up during dark time, down during night time, up during down, dark time, down during night time. Okay, and this master clock is in the form of two nuclei that are in the brain. Okay, and these two nuclei are called the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, and this is our next topic of study. We want to study these two nuclei. Now, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, for short, are abbreviated to the SCN. Okay, suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, and they sit above the optic chiasm, which is why they're called the supra above chiasmatic nuclei. Okay, so, time for a bit of neuroanatomy then. I want to show you exactly where these two nuclei are. So, we'll start with our most basic picture of the brain. So, if you look at the brain from, let's say, the left-hand side, okay, you'll see something that looks similar to this. So, here is the cerebral hemisphere, the left cerebral hemisphere, viewed from the side. And then you'll see the brain stem emerging from underneath. So, you might see the pons there and the medulla below that. Okay, like so. And then the spinal cord will come out the bottom. And then sitting down here, you'll then have the cerebellum. Okay, so let's colour in the different portions here. So, we've got the cerebral hemisphere in pink, and we're viewing the left-hand side. So this is where your forehead would be, this is where the back of your head would be. Okay, so this is the left cerebral hemisphere. Then emerging from underneath the uh, left cerebral hemisphere that we can see here, uh, you have the bottom portions of the brain stem. Okay, so this portion here that I'm now colouring in orange, that's representing the pons, okay? Uh, below the pons, you then have another portion, um, which I'll colour in in green here, okay? And, whoops, not quite. I'll have that bit there. Okay, that's known as the medulla, or the full name is medulla oblongata, uh, but no one calls it that. Everyone calls it just the medulla, okay? And then, uh, below the medulla, not in pink, I'll have it in blue, you then have the spinal cord, which will then go down through the vertebral uh, column uh, and um, gives off the peripheral neurons. Okay, so this is the spinal cord. And then sitting uh, behind the brainstem, behind the pons and the medulla down here, which we'll have in red, we then have the cerebellum. Okay, at the present, we cannot see the suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, from the picture that we are looking at. Firstly, they are absolutely tiny little things, okay, and also they're hidden in a structure that's deep within the cerebral hemispheres here, okay? Uh, they're hidden in a structure called the hypothalamus. Now, it's true that if we turned the brain upside down, okay, so if we looked from the underside, so if we sort of repositioned ourselves or repositioned the brain and looked from the underside, we would see the bottom of the hypothalamus. But what I'm going to do to draw this picture is I'm going to uh, imagine that we can just sort of vanish away the cerebral hemispheres. So we're going to take away all of this stuff, and we're going to continue the brain stem on, which is going up right through the middle of the two hemispheres. So you've got the left cerebral hemisphere that we're seeing uh, from looking at the left-hand side, and then on the opposite side you'll have the right cerebral hemisphere. We're going to take these two off and just look at the thing that sits in between them, which is the brain stem, and then going up into the diencephalon. Okay, right. Uh, so, shall I try and squeeze another picture in here? Yes. So, we'll start then with the spinal cord, the medulla, and the pons, which we've already seen, and then we'll extend it on upwards. So, I'll have to keep this nice and low, otherwise I'm not going to fit it in here. So, this can be the pons, this can then be the medulla here, and then we've got the spinal cord going down. So, I'll highlight these in their colours again. So, here's the spinal cord in blue. Uh, the medulla is here in green, 
Whoops. Uh, above the Madulla, we then have the ponds, uh, which are colouring in orange here. Okay, now above the ponds, you then have a region known as the midbrain. Okay, so I'll put this here. So this is what's known as the midbrain. We couldn't see this from our picture. It was obscured by the cerebral hemispheres. So this is called the mid... Whoops, not like that. Um, midbrain. Right. Okay, and I'll colour in the midbrain in red. Now, I won't show the cerebellum because that's not part of the brain stem and it's not particularly important for our discussion of the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, now, sitting on top of the midbrain, you have structures known as the thalami. Now, you do not just have one thalamus, you actually have two thalamus. Uh, well, what two thalami is the plural. We can only see the left thalamus because we are looking from the left-hand side. In a moment, I'll draw you a picture where we look down from above and you'll then be able to see this two thalamus thalami, which sit nicely on top of the two sides of the midbrain. You only have one midbrain, but you know it's uh, symmetric down the midline. And uh, you have one thalamus perched on top of one side, and the other thalamus uh, perched on top of the other side. Okay, uh, we can see the left thalamus, and they both have this sort of egg-shaped structure. Okay, well, they both have this egg-shaped um, shape, <laughs> okay, uh, and then sitting in front of the thalami, you then have the hypothalamus, okay, so the hypothalamus will have here, and I want it coming off more like this. Now, the hypothalamus has certain distinguishable features, so there are these little sort of projections, these domes coming down, uh, which are called the mammillary bodies, okay, but they don't have anything to do with uh, lactation, okay, then, um, Coming down here, you then have the pituitary stalk with the anterior pituitary and then the posterior pituitary there, okay? And then in the front, you then have the optic chiasm here, which is that uh, place where uh, fibres from the optic two optic nerves cross over. Okay, right, so let's colour this in then. So, um, all of this is the hypothalamus. In yellow there... Uh, that's the optic chiasm, okay, and I might as well try and show you on this picture where the suprachiasmatic nuclei are going to be. Now, I can't show you both on this picture, I can only show you one, because we're, remember we're looking from the left-hand side, so I can only show you the left suprachiasmatic nucleus, but it'll be sitting in that sort of position, just above the optic chiasm. Okay, so in vivid purple there, that's the suprachiasmatic nucleus on the left-hand side. So this is the left suprachiasmatic nucleus. Okay, right. Then we've got the rest of the hypothalamus here with the pituitary gland here. Okay, so I'll highlight uh, the pituitary gland and I haven't got enough colours. I'm going to have to start uh, using them twice. So here is the pituitary gland here in per pink, not purple. Okay, so... I haven't even got enough space to put labels. Uh, here is the pituitary gland, okay, and then uh, we've got the hypothalamus is the rest of that structure. So all of this is hypothalamus. Um, so I will colour it in in orange. So all of this is the hypothalamus sitting just in front of the thalami. Now, to get a better understanding of this structure, I need to show you the picture where we're looking from above, because at the moment you're only seeing a left-hand side view, and that's a very biased view. You're not going to get a complete picture of this three-dimensional structure if we don't look from above. Okay, so I'll get another piece of paper and show you a picture from above now. Okay, right. So we're going to look from above. Um, so, I'll start by drawing the two thalami, okay? So, here is one thalamus, this is going to be the right thalamus, and then here we've got the left thalamus, okay? And they'll be sitting on top of the midbrain, okay? So, this is the right thalamus, okay? And then we've also got the left thalamus. And I think I'll colour uh, both of the thalami in, in red, okay? Now, the hypothalamus, then, is going to project forward from these two thalami. Okay, but it's not going to be a solid lump, because it's going to continue on this gap that you have between the two thalami. Okay, so you have this very important gap here, and I'll tell you the name of that 
gap in a moment, but the hypothalamus is basically in a horseshoe-like shape, okay, like so. And it continues on this void gap here that sits in between uh, the two thalami and now is down the middle of the two sides of the hypothalamus. So you have the left-hand side of the hypothalamus here and the right-hand side of the hypothalamus here. Okay, and you really didn't get a perspective of that just from looking at the side, okay? You couldn't see that there was this gap between the two thalami and that this uh, gap was continued on uh, to divide the hypothalamus into a left side and a right side. Okay, so what is this gap here called? Well, it's full of a fluid. It's full of cerebrospinal fluid, and it's known as the third ventricle. Okay, so this is the position of the third ventricle. Now, I'll colour in then the hypothalamus in um, orange here. So this is the hypothalamus, and then I'll show you where the two suprachiasmatic nuclei are. And because we are um, looking from above, we can see where the two are this time. But first, I'll just draw colour in the third ventricle. So the third ventricle here in yellow, this is full of cerebrospinal fluid. Okay, and it connects to the fourth ventricle and also to the first and the second ventricles, which are also called the lateral ventricles. Okay, so it connects to the fourth ventricle uh, through uh, the cerebral aqueduct, which runs through the midbrain. Uh, that remember these uh, two thalami here are connected, to, well, are sitting on top of. Okay, right. Uh, so here is the hypothalamus sitting in front of the thalami here. Okay, and what we now want to see is where these two suprachiasmatic nuclei are within the hypothalamus. So if we're looking down from above, here will be the two suprachiasmatic nuclei. Okay, so compare that with our previous picture. They're low down in the structure of the hypothalamus, and they're sitting on either side of the third ventricle, which divides the two of them, basically. Um, okay, and they're just above where the optic chiasm runs underneath the hypothalamus. Okay, so I'll try and colour those in in vivid purple. So these are our two suprachiasmatic nuclei here. Got one there another one here. So they are the suprachiasmatic nuclei. Now, um, we will call it there for this video, and in the next video we'll continue our discussion of the suprachiasmatic nuclei anatomy, and then we'll have a look at their function as the master clock.